it's a very difficult evening and um, we're also very happy to have uh, delegates from the airport, um, Nevia, Fanny, um, Sobrulai is with us and uh, Nikos Lagonikos from Caristos is also with us. Uh, thank you so much. Well, now I'm going to introduce, first of all, my dear, dear old colleague, uh, Dr. Zarko Tankovic. I don't think he needs a specific introduction, but anyway, I'm going to say a few words. Uh, Zarko has been with Mia uh, since 2013, uh, when I also joined mm -hmm. the Institute. So I, I have been sort of following the progress of this fantastic project, Gurimadi. Um, Zarko holds a BA in archaeology from the University of Indiana uh, in the US, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, from uh, Serbia, University of Belgrade, and a, May and a PhD in anthropology from Indiana University in Bloomington. From uh, 2013 to 2021, uh, Zarko was um, a consultant and responsible for all archaeological uh, projects here at MIA. Um, he has done a lot of research, both uh, in Serbia, in Greece, in South Africa recently, because of his new job uh, at the University of Bergen. Now Zarko has moved to Bergen and he's a project manager for the Center of Early Sapiens Behavior. It's a center of excellence um, within the Department of Archaeology, History, Cultural Studies and Religion at the University of Bergen. His extensive experience includes participation in numerous archaeological rescue projects in the US, as well as involvement in all leadership of archaeological field research initiatives in Serbia, South Africa, and of course, uh, GAP, Greece, um, GAP, and also Skip. Uh, he's um, the co-director of the Small Cycladic um, Islands Project and the project manager of Blombos Cave Excavations in South Africa. Gurimavi is his child in a way. He started exploring the area in 2012, I think, my Zarko. Yes. And now he's the project director uh, together with uh, Dr. Pascal Zafiriadis. Uh, the next person in the team, uh, Pascal, has uh, succeeded Zarko in the position here at, um, uh, at MIA, at the Norwegian Institute. He has joined us uh, in 2021. He is uh, an advisor and researcher uh, at uh, the Norwegian Institute, and at the same time, he's uh, teaching uh, archaeology, uh, prehistoric archaeology, at the um, um, at the New York University, and its study abroad program in Athens. Pascalis uh, holds a PhD uh, from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, he's an archaeologist specializing in Aegean prehistory with a primary focus on the intrasite spatial organization of late Neolithic early Bronze Age communities. He is also very interested uh, in other uh, fields of uh, archaeology, mm -hmm. theoretical archaeology, excavation, methodology and stratigraphy, digital archaeology and cave archaeology. Pascalis has been uh, a field researcher and uh, field director and uh, he's co-directing GAP. Uh, this project involves a Neolithic Early Bronze Age excavation in Carisus, as you probably know, and is conducted by the Norwegian Institute since uh, 2018. Last but not least, we have um, a very honored to have uh, in the team um, cultural um, ministry archaeologist, uh, Dr. Fanis Mavridis. Fanis is with the Ministry of Culture, the effort of Paleoanthropology and Spilology, he has received a BA, uh, an MPhil, uh, and a PhD from the National and Capodistrian University uh, in Athens uh, in Aegean, in archaeology and specifically Aegean prehistory. And uh, he expanded his academic uh, studies by receiving a Master of Science uh, from the University of Sheffield in environmental archaeology and paleoeconomy. Panis has been um, awarded a grant from the National uh, Scholarship Foundation, together with other numerous scholarships and research awards. He served as a Getty Research Exchange Fellow for the Mediterranean Basin and the Middle East, uh, studying Neolithic uh, Anatolia. He has also been teaching at the university, in the National Anthropodistrian University, to graduate and postgraduate students. 
His academic interests focus on Neolithic Aegean, Bronze Age Cyclades, and cave and island archaeology. Uh, Dr. Mavridis has conducted systematic and rescue excavations in various regions, including Attica, Evoia, and the Cyclades, also Akrotiri on Santorini. To date, he has authored three books and over 50 articles contributing significantly, significantly to the field. Um, <laughs> before I give the floor to to Geoffrey, uh, you representing the team, Zarka and Kosali. I would like to say that we also have a publication uh, by Dr. Zarko Tankozits on uh, Evia following a conference uh, that happened in 2015. And the book is um, sold out. You can't find the physical copy, but you can uh, find it online through the uh, University of Bergen Library. So I'm encouraging you to follow up on this lecture by um, having a look at the book. So the floor is yours, Zarko. I um, guess you are starting. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. Start off with an applause. That's a good start, I think. Uh, well, thank you, David, for this very nice introduction. It's uh, very good to be here again, and especially to see so many friendly faces in the uh, in the audience. Uh, it's a bit of an emotional comeback for me, I have to say, uh, because I have uh, many, many times been in this room, but this is only the second time I've given a lecture from this side of the pulpit. <laughs> Last one being 2011, just before I moved here. So it's also a very special, um, uh, special moment for me. And also, as they said, Gurimadi is my baby. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a combination of a lot of research with a lot of good people uh, and colleagues uh, in the area. And uh, uh, we, I think, have hit a jackpot in many ways. Uh, so I'm very proud of this site and all the people that are involved uh, with the research there. I also like talking about my research, so I apologize if I would go a little bit too long this time, but um, I don't come to Greece just for nothing. So uh, <laughs> just to repeat what they just said, the Gurimadi Archaeological Project, or as we lovingly call it, GAP, um, that creates some confusion, I can tell you. <laughs> but on the positive side, we can use GAP equipment as their own, uh, is a, uh, a single run archaeological excavation uh, uh, under the uh, from a, a permit from the Norwegian Institute at Athens, uh, which belongs to the University of Bergen, uh, and so do I, in a way, uh, and is uh, given a permit by the, of course, the Ministry of Culture. Uh, uh, and we have had, I have to say, a very good and seamless collaboration with the Ministry, and especially the effort in Evia. Uh, I've been working there since 2005, through many different uh, directors and many different with many different colleagues. Some of us not, some of them not among us uh, anymore, unfortunately. And I can say nothing but good words uh, on my collaboration uh, with uh, our colleagues there. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the chronology, and I'm assuming there's not that many of you, uh, this is generally uh, the period that we are going to talk about. So we're talking about the late Neolithic, the end of the Neolithic period. Paleolithic and the early Bronze Age, especially its two first phases, because we have so far not found um, the third phase. So we're talking about two, two and a half thousand years of prehistory. Now, this is uh, a subject of a lot of discussion and controversy. I know that many people working on <laughs> these periods have different opinions uh, how the chronology goes. Uh, I understand this, but this is just an orientation for those not familiar with uh, the prehistoric Aegean chronology. We actually published a book about uh, this period, 5th and 4th millennia um, uh, BC, around the Aegean region. Uh, I am sorry for the shameless self-promotion, but it was an excellent conference <laughs> that we did together with our colleagues from the Danish Institute in Athens and my good friends, uh, Fanny Smavridi, Søren Ditz, and uh, Turan Tekoglu from Turkey. Uh, the conference was great. I think the book uh, that followed it is even better. Uh, look it up if you're interested in this uh, period. It has a lot of interesting stuff from the Balkans, uh, Anatolia, and generally the uh, the area of the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, to go back to the topic of our uh, talk tonight, the site of Gurimadi, uh, for those of you not aware, uh, it is on the southern uh, tip of the island of Evia, the second largest Aegean island, uh, very close to Athens, or relatively close to Athens. Uh, Southern Evia is a very special region to me. I uh, have been working there, as I said, since 2005. Uh, I consider it my second home. In fact, probably my first home at this point, mm -hmm. after having moved so much. It is a very interesting region as well in terms of um, uh, archaeology and geography. It's a very um, um, diverse region. 
Uh, it consists of several uh, sections, uh, so to speak. There are two large, see if this thing works, two large planes, the Caceronio plane and the Caristian Campos, Campos Caristu, uh, and two large peninsula that uh, frame this horseshoe shaped uh, Bay of Caristos, the Paximada. And the uh, Buros Castri, as we call it, doesn't have a local name, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but we call it that way for convenience sake, according to the settlements on both of its sides, Buros here and Castillo on the other side. So this is uh, these two plains and the area around the bay is what I consider Caristia for terms of in terms of prehistoric occupation. We also have this very rugged area here towards Cavadoro and the Cape Cafireos. Uh, this is the area that also has uh, prehistoric archaeological material that we have found actually with some of the caves and some of the open sites with uh, my colleague Fanis Mavridis. But this is the area that was not easily accessible uh, on foot, even uh, in prehistoric times. Um, and only recently the roads have been uh, pushed there. Uh, I have marked some of the important prehistoric sites here. There's uh, Placari and non phanolithic sites are yet the other cave that we also excavated uh, with Fanis uh, 2006 to 2008. Part of it has been published. It's a very interesting cave uh, with uh, prehistoric early Bronze Age burials. Um, so Car uh, Gurimadi as a site is not alone in this area. The area is full of pre prehistoric material and of course later material as well. Uh, the location of Gurimadi is here, so it straddles this. Um, transitional uh, ridge, so to speak, uh, between the Ano Campos and the Cato Campos, the uh, Cazzaronio Plain, mm -hmm. as we call it, and uh, uh, Campos, and which gives it which gives it a very, very distinct uh, geographical position. And this is one of the reasons we have chosen it uh, to work there. And uh, I also want to say how we found the site first, uh, because this was a completely archaeologically unknown area. Uh, and we found it during a previous Norwegian Institute project in uh, in uh, in the Caristia, the so-called Norwegian Archaeological Survey in the Caristia, or NASC for short. Uh, it was a, a project of five years of archaeological intensive, very intensive survey of the Caceronio Plain, um, diachronic survey. So we were not looking only for prehistoric sites. Uh, uh, we have found a lot more than we expected. This is uh, approximately, or actually this is the exact uh, location of the survey area. Uh, you can see the pink areas are the, the regions that were not surveyed uh, because of various reasons, usually disturbance or uh, modern buildings. Um, and uh, this is about 20 square kilometers. I think we covered about 73% of the area in which we have found 99 sites. Uh, it was 106, but then we kind of joined a couple to, together after uh, post research or post field work uh, mm -hmm. analysis. We have 36 prehistoric sites, which is a large number. And when I say site, I just want to specify not all these places are settlements. Some are just scatters of obsidian or scatters of pottery, more or less representing um, places of activity, whether single activity or repeated activity remains to be seen. Um, but uh, the, mo the majority of the sites we found actually belong to the classical period. Uh, however, 36 prehistoric sites is very, very impressive for an area of 20 uh, square kilometers. Now, there are several reasons why we've chosen um, Gurimadi as a site to uh, expand the research on. Because we have had other candidates as well. We have found at least two more uh, very interesting and very promising prehistoric sites. But then uh, after doing the resurvey, and we resurveyed this site several times, we have found something you don't find every day. First of all, we have found a complete uh, copper axe or adze uh, on the surface of the site. And you know, to the archaeologists among you, I can I don't have to explain how rare of a find this is to have find a, a whole a copper axe uh, on the surface. And we have also collected, um, once we looked at them on a pile, because different uh, surveyors were collecting them separately, we have collected a very large number of obsidian arrowheads, in addition to other obsidian material. Obsidian volcanic glass that comes from uh, several sources, but most from the, mostly from uh, Milos. Uh, we have found 50, more than 50 uh, arrowheads on the surface, which at that point was uh, one of the largest numbers of arrowheads found on the surface of any site. So it gave us, in addition to pottery that we found, it could date the site originally to the Phanolithic and Early Bronze Age 1 period. Uh, 
uh, it gave us an idea that this is an important location, location that could produce a lot of information that we could uh, use, especially since this transition from the uh, Neolithic to the Early Bronze Age is what interests me the most, especially in this area. And of course, the location uh, or the site uh, mm -hmm. contributed to our choice because this uh, site is essentially a natural hill fort um, with amazing views uh, to all areas. It's impossible to approach the site without being seen, unless you do it at night, of course. Uh, but uh, this location pointed to some kind of importance as well in terms of defense, uh, possibly. And the site is situated around this large outcrop. This is the Gurimadi Hill. Gurimadi in the local uh, Arvanitic idiom means uh, uh, big hill, essentially. The site, as we found it in the surface, uh, so we're looking here from, from this side, from the uh, northeast, let's say. The site, uh, the material found the surface stretches from around here, this area, all the way down here. It tapers off here, but we still found material, including arrowheads. And the largest concentration of the finds uh, that we have is from here. Now, you're asking why are we digging here? And I'm going to let Pasalis explain this later. Uh, but there's a very good reason. Now, some of our research goals, of course, we just wanted to see what was there. I mean, first and foremost, let's be completely honest. I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, we tend to uh, come up with hypotheses and everything, but it's important also to see what's there because a site of this nature does not come very often. But it's also the first systematic excavation of a finalistic site in Southern Avia. Uh, there have been many uh, excavations of prehistoric sites. All of them, almost all of them, in fact, that's not all of them, have been have happened in the rescue context, uh, mostly done by the colleagues from the uh, Ministry of Culture for the effort of Antiquities of Avia. Uh, a lot of good information has, has come out of that, uh, but they had to happen under a certain schedule, as you all know. Uh, building construction is happening, uh, what was done, what was preserved. So this uh, approach of a systematic excavation is uh, important for a better understanding of prehistory. Also, it's a rare prehistoric multiple phase site that we have in Evia. Most of them are single uh, period or they don't include uh, these two uh, periods at the same time, especially not open air sites. Um, we have found this uh, 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 copper and it's mostly copper, I'll get to that later, uh, acts on the surface. So uh, we were wondering whether we can find some evidence of local metallurgical activities, especially in the light of preservation of this axe, and it seemed not to have been a final product. So we hoped that we'll uh, find some evidence for the local making of this type of artifacts. Spoiler alert, we didn't, uh, but we also found some other interesting uh, uh, copper active artifacts. And then we wanted to determine the use of the site um, especially in the light of so many arrowheads found on the surface. And one of our hypotheses, one that we started the project with is that this was a hunting camp of some kind um, because it was probably the edge of a pre-forested area back in prehistory. And then uh, we want to explore the evidence of prehistoric maritime interactions because all this obsidian is not local. Uh, we have found evidence in terms of pottery of different uh, imported wares. Southern Evia, often uh, is um, mentioned in uh, in uh, connection with the original peopling of the Cycladic Islands or the permanent mm -hmm. peopling of the Cycladic Islands at the end of the Neolithic period. So we wanted to explore to see if we can find some evidence for these kind of activities. Now, this is the site once we removed the vegetation in the first year just before the excavation. As I said, we found a lot of movable material, obsidian, uh, pottery, uh, copper X. Uh, uh, we have not found evidence of walls on the surface. However, we expected them uh, because uh, we have found a lot of loose rock around here that had no business of being there other than being part of some kind of construction. Um, we started our excavation here because we were hoping to find the best preserved layers. However, I thought originally that uh, those would be maybe 50 centimeters. Boy, was I wrong. Uh, so you can see some progression of the excavation clockwise here. This is the second year, third, fourth. I skipped uh, the fifth year. Uh, and you can see from nothing, we started expanding this and finding more and more evidence uh, of architectural remains. And this is where we are at now in the 2023. 
So you can see this is a very, very architecturally complex site. Uh, and it's uh, almost unique in prehistory uh, in the Aegean, and especially in this period, to find such well-preserved walls. Uh, and also stratigraphy, and also the depth of the, of the stratigraphic layers. But to tell you something more about this, I would like to ask my colleague, Pasalis, to continue. Oh, if you want. But, yeah. uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, so, so um, we'll present you uh, a general overview of our methodology of our excavation the last five, six years, and uh, some very basic, I'm going to provide you with some very basic observations concerning the architecture at uh, Gurimadi. As a spoiler alert, since we are in the uh, in the middle of uh, studying the results of the first five years, published these results on a on a big paper. Uh, most of the uh, of the lecture will actually be on uh, very preliminary re uh, observations and conclusions. Uh, so between 2018 and 2023, we excavated nine trenches covering an area of approximately 130. Uh, square meters. Almost all trenches, except for trench four, trench two. I'm sorry, uh, down here uh, in the southern sector of uh, the plateau part of the hill, uh, follow the hill's east-west uh, axis. Uh, despite the higher material density on the southern slope, as Zarko uh, mentioned before, uh, during the survey of the site, uh, we our primary focus was and still is on the summit. This strategic choice aimed at revealing in situ anthropogenic layers to provide insights into the stratigraphic chronology and the overall nature of the site. Mm -hmm. Our decision, as Darko mentioned, was influenced by the observation that surface material on the south slope uh, was likely uh, reached there uh, through uh, because of natural erosion from the summit. The presence of, presence of scattered stones on the summit of uh, the hill further suggested potential uh, buried architectural features, so thus solidifying our choice to prioritize excavation in that area. <clears throat> the depth of the excavated deposits on the summit has exceeded our initial expectations significantly. So typologically speaking, we're talking about the hillside. And as a rule, uh, hillsides, I mean, in average, have uh, the, the depth of the deposits about uh, 40 to 70 centimeters. Uh, we actually uh, revealed part of the bedrock now in about 1.992 meters below the modern surface of the hill. Uh, the bedroom was revealed, is, has been revealed on the northeast uh, and central sector, sectors of trench uh, one. It consists of heavily eroded cyst formations, uh, the, basically the same material used uh, in the architecture of the uncovered walls. Uh, in some areas, the bedrock is also intermixed with natural reddish brown clay, clay deposit. Uh, directly above it, we have unearthed an inconsistent thin layer containing small surge and stones. Uh, while in the central sec so sector, uh, this layer in also includes charcoal spec specks and burned building material. Uh, our excavation methodology is grounded on our commitment to reconstruct the site's formation processes with meticulous detail, aiming to document individual and or intersected depositional episodes and contexts. To ensure the consistent application of our methodology, we employed the excavation unit as our primary excavation and recording entity. Following protocols similar to those widely used in other projects, we conceptualized the, the excavation unit as representing three-dimensional space, uh, in, in including the excavated soil and any, any sort of architecture uh, or, uh, or feature. Uh, in principle, each excavation unit can represent an individual anthropogenic or natural depositional activity. However, in practice, it wasn't always feasible uh, to trace such individual episodes. Uh, therefore, many times during the excavation, we had to define arbitrary excavation units, uh, which were later merged uh, post-excavationally. To establish a consistent data trail, we developed the digital recording forms for both our excavation units and diagnostic finds. Our digital recording system is a modified version of the system designed for the archaeological project at the Neolithic excava excavation in Palabela in Pieria, conducted by the Aristotle University and the University of Sheffield. So all our data is collected through digital forms. For data collection, we initially utilized the ODK Collect software, offering the affordable flexibility we needed. Initially, our recording procedures also involved more conventional and analog means uh, for recording, such as maintaining a separate handwritten excavation journal. 
However, in 2019, we were fortunate to have Dr. Dan Sanenova become part of our team, and she successfully redesigned and transitioned our recording system to FileMaker Pro uh, software, moving our procedures into a fully digital mode. All quantifiable excavation data, such as vol vo uh, soil volume and specifications, inclusions, etc., for each excavation units are entered into a corresponding excavation unit form. This quantitative quantitative data is complemented by qualitative and descriptive information, including stratigraphic relationships among excavation units and tentative, tentative interpretative comments. Additionally, artifacts of high diagnostic capacity uh, and all stable features are documented in separate, digi separate digital forms based on the respective categories. Our sampling procedures involve systematically collecting flotation and soil samples for each excavation unit, along with extensive samples or uh, sampling of ecofacts and other organic material with diagnostic value. Significant efforts have been made to collect micromorphology samples from both the profiles of the trenches and important contexts uh, context within the trenches. This comprehensive, this comprehensive approach aims to study site formation processes, refine the site stratigraphic record, and gain a better understanding of the use of space. Finally, all excavation metrics are meticulously recorded using a total station. In addition, we systematically employ photogrammetry for recording visualization and post-excavation analysis purposes. We commence the excavation by opening the first two trenches, one positioned at the very center of the summit and the other in the southern part, just above the south slope. The objective was to access undisturbed deposits and gain insights into the utilization of space uh, in, this in these areas. Trench 1, currently the most extensive trench, reached, revealed a complex stratigraphy heavily altered by numerous walls and other stable features. On the other hand, Trench 2 produced much material, but almost none uh, other stratigraphic uh, or architectural data. As illustrated on the slide, uh, in subsequent years, we expanded the excavated area in an aggregating manner to comprehend the horizontal distribution of occupation at the site. Uh, the primary factor determining the opening of new trenches was the discovery in each newly opened trench of dense architectural features, mostly curv curvilinear stone-built walls, extending, as we can see on the slide, beyond the trench boundaries. These features posed challenges to reconstructing the site stratigraphy and limited the space available for excavation. Consequently, we strateg strategically opened new trenches contiguous to existing ones. This aimed to elucidate the nature of the site architectural remains and obtain stratigraphic evidence unobstructed by architectural elements. For example, uh, in areas such as the famous northwestern corner of Trench 1, the presence of dense architectural features along the trench, uh, trench sides emerging or emerging at its floor renders further excavation impossible. Okay. Give you an idea, and so you can see here we have four walls four walls on the sides and one wall at the bottom of the trench. And this is about 30 or even less centimeters. So it's impossible to continue excavation. All nine trenches have consistently produced homogeneous categories of movable and architectural finds. The abundance and diversity of movable finds coupled with the presence of numerous and dense architectural remains provide evidence of a typical prehistoric settlement characterized by intensive and long-term occupation. Pottery and obsidian lithic finds, which will be detailed further, are the most well-represented artifactual categories. Additionally, there is notable presence of figurines, round stone tools, spindle walls, a few copper artifacts, and various ecofacts, primarily domesticated animal faunal remains. In addition to animal bones, a partially preserved human skull was excavated in the north se northeast sector of Trench 1 from a context interpreted as an open-air refuse area. Stable features and architectural remains stand out as the most significant discoveries in Gurimali. Except for Trench 2, every trench has yielded extensive and densely distributed architectural remains. The architectural features also include various ancillary installations common in settlements, in settlements of the period represented in Gurimali. What distinguishes Gurimali in terms of its architecture is the, is the exceptional preservation of uh, its stone-built walls. As illustrated on the slide, certain walls extend over 1.5 meters in length, uh, with a preservation height that is almost unparalleled for sites from these periods. For instance, wall uh, I-4, as you can see on the slide, <clears throat> preserves uh, 21 of its courses in a height of about 1.8 meters. Okay. And again, this is prehistoric, not like medieval-like people uh, yeah. visiting the excavation thing. It's not true. No, it's definitely, <laughs> definitely prehistoric. So, uh, and... Fanny Mavridis is the co-director of the excavation to prove that. So according to uh, Dr. Mavridis' examination of ceramic assemblages, 
uh, the dating of all excavated, excavated architectural remains from the early uh, should be dated from the early stages of the late Neolithic to the early Bronze Age period, and specifically the early Bronze Age II uh, phase. So notably, there is a complete absence of any finds, uh, movable finds that can that can post date the EBA uh, two period. Okay. Uh, which can also be a, a, a decisive factor for the preservation of uh, the architecture, as uh, apparently there was no or little uh, post-abandonment uh, disturbance. Uh, the study of ceramic assemblages, including the synchronization and ascription to uh, stratigraphic layers, is still in progress. Additionally, while waiting for C14 results, it is premature today to assign to it's premature to assign individual architectural remains to specific phases and periods. Nevertheless, uh, multiple architectural phases are evident spanning different archaeological periods, but also occurring within individual periods. In each trend, stone built walls are layered at one atop another, indicating two or more architectural phases in each case. The current image uh, of uh, the site resembles a palimpsest made of stone, hindering our efforts to reconstruct the site stratigraphy. This complexity also makes it challenging to synchronize architectural phases, finalize the interpretation of functional and structural relationships between excavated walls and determine the type of built structure to which the walls belong. As we conclude the study for publication of the first year, five years of the excavation, today we'll just provide broader observations concerning the nature of uh, construction, the, the, of the nature and construction details of the excavated walls. Now, initial suspicions of ancient architecture on Gudimadi arose uh, during the NASC project site survey. The presence of dense scatters of natural stones, primarily cysts, uh, on the hill's flat summit indicated the potential existence of ancient structures. Stone built walls are consistently found in all trenches and, on, and layers. Uh, in addition to walls, the excavation has uncovered various stable features, including benches, post holes, shallower depressions related to structural or domestic activities refuse pits and thermal installations, including hearths and at least two ovens. Notably, the presence of floors and surfaces constructed with hard packed uh, clay soil have be, have been also recovered. Uh, for the purposes of today's lecture, we will focus on the stone built walls. The preservation of the excavated walls is remarkable, as mentioned before. This preservation can be attributed to the site's abandonment after the early Bronze Age period and the practice of rebuilding uh, atop earlier walls without completely dismantling them. This process sometimes occurred following destruction episodes that sealed previous habitation under substantial uh, structural debris. Additionally, the prevalent use of stone uh, uh, as the primary construction material has further contributed to the preservation of architecture. The surviving walls are uh, preserved in variable, variable dimensions. Their orientation is equally variable uh, sometimes also shifting between uh, different architectural phases and periods, but as a rule with a curvilinear outline. All trenches have produced such walls in different elevations, spanning almost all stratigraphic layers uh, assigned for the site. Despite the numerous walls, as excavation in all trenches is incomplete, it's insecure to move on with assigning complete or partial uh, ground plans for the involved constructions. As you notice, most of the walls are of significant length, exceeding the boundaries of single trends. The partial reuse of regular walls as foundations for newer construction appear to be common, a common practice in Gurimali. An illustration of this is observed, for example, in Trench 1, where wall I-11 is found on the partial remains of wall I-31, as you can see here, or even in the case of wall I-30 and wall I-24. Uh, in some cases, walls are directly constructed, constructed on the bedrock, uh, such as wall I-4 in Trench 1, which cuts through earlier deposits down to the partially leveled bedrock. Additionally, new walls with different orientation are occasionally built atop earlier ones by cancelling them, or they may even uh, cut through or budding them. A preliminary examination of the walls indicates a rather stable masonry style, utilizing the soft and readily available local cyst found in abundance uh, on the hill. The initial assessment of the building material does not reveal extensive preparation of the stones before construction. Additionally, the wall fabric features exhausted querns made from non-local material to the hill, repurposed in secondary uh, use. Notably, a couple of small sandstone blocks with a brick-like shape are also present. The wall fabric primarily comprises packed clay 
uh, and soil with inclusions of small sherds and gravel. Regarding the superstructure of the walls, the excavation of a few burnt chunks of dope suggests the potential application of plaster uh, on the stone built walls. However, the low volume of the dope pieces does not support the widespread adoption of this practice. Similarly, the absence of evidence suggesting the extensive use of mud bricks reinforces the notion that the excavated structure should have been uh, fully constructed uh, on, with stone. The discovery of, a cer of circular post hole like features on walls from the upper strata of the excavation introduces another potential structural element related to the superstructure of the walls. These features are constructed with small stones arranged to form roughly circular post holes. Um, and apart from the one found on the top of surface wall I4, which we see here, um, the rest are uh, generally shallow and uh, carelessly made. Notably, the one atop wall I4 is the widest one and the one and the most carefully built. These post hole like features might suggest a form of superstructure support, possibly serving as receptacles for upright uh, support elements. As for now, as of now, the excavation has not provided any information regarding the potential roofing of the excavated structures, including details about the raw materials used or the, or the types of roofs. Specifically, in areas with dense architectural remains and successive phases, securely assigning the uh, indoor or outdoor functions for each phase can be challenging. The ongoing analysis of micromorphological samples aims to provide clarity on, this, on such issues. In specific cases, distinctions between open air and roof spaces can be made based on, based on observation of site formation processes, the presence of floors, uh, and the distribution of ancillary installations. Before offering some uh, general concluding uh, observation on Gurimadis's architecture, it's crucial to mention the presence of a very peculiar and unique, uh, both for Gurimadi but also for the whole southern area, uh, architectural feature uh, from the lowest levels of trenches five and six. Specifically in these trenches, we uncovered uh, the remains of a possible adobe made structure. You can see here in trench five spanning uh, out of uh, five, six, uh, in a uh, surviving in a rather amorphous and uh, uh, in irregular shape and flanked on its southeast side by three shallow uh, post hole like depressions. Yeah, because of the lights, you probably you cannot see it, but okay. one, two, three, or one, two, three. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, as you can see on the slide, the lack of space to continue deeper excavation in these trenches does not allow us to fully understand this feature. However, and while we're still unsure about the type of structure, what is notable is the use of different building material compared to the prevalent use of stones in the upper strata and throughout the rest of the excavated areas. Immediately above this adobe made structure, we have recovered the earliest pottery at the site so far, a matte painted surge there, indicating that whatever the structure is, it should be uh, one of the earliest occupation remains at the site. In conclusion, the architectural finds from Gurimadi, for, uh, concerning the architectural uh, finds from Gurimadi, we may note the long term and intensive use of the site summit for building purposes. Uh, the presence of successive architectural phases spanning the late Neolithic to the early Bronze Age period, the scenario that some of the architectural phases may fall within the conventional chronological boundaries of a single archaeological period, the dominance of stone built masonry, except for the adobe made structure ascribed to the earliest activity discovered at the site. Um, also, the presence of both open air and roof spaces in the in the excavated area, and finally, that the excavations at Burimadi have unveiled the earliest architectural remains in southern area so far. Okay. So I will now hand over uh, back to Zarko to, to continue with the presentation of pottery and the finds. Right. Okay. All right, so. To summarize what Pasali said, we love our walls. <laughs> I mean, and it really doesn't sit well with us that we really can't understand them that well so far, but we're working on it. Uh, and uh, once we do uh, figure it out, I think it's going to be very significant for understanding prehistory in this part of, uh, of the Aegean. Now, other than the walls, uh, we have, of course, other stuff. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about pottery and the lithics uh, before offering some general conclusions. Uh, like every other, archaeological uh, site from this period, uh, ceramics is our biggest produce. We have a lot of it, and you can see just one of these uh, sita here uh, drying. 
And I would like to thank before I proceed uh, Fanis Mavridis for uh, summarizing the pottery. And I would particularly like to take uh, to thank Dr. Vaya Mastronopoulou, who was with us the last two seasons on uh, the, the project during the excavation and has offered some very valuable insights into the pottery. Before the pottery, however, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the figurines uh, that we have. Uh, we have some, we don't have many. Um, this is not unusual for Neolithic sites, uh, other than uh, uh, notable special sites, uh, such as Sarikinos Cave in Riotia, they produced uh, indeed large numbers of, uh, of figurines. Uh, animal figurines from the site are even rarer. We have one or two, one and a half maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this uh, little guy here, and I know it's difficult to see, but once you see it, you can even see it. This is a head of a ram, and there's actually a, a twisted horn here. Uh, this might have been an application on the pottery, on the rim of the pottery as well. So I'm not sure if this is a complete uh, self-standing figurine. And we have we have found during the survey one piece of uh, bait clay that seemed to have horns. So this is the extent of the animal figurine so far. Um, so uh, we also have several uh, human figurines that belong to various types. Uh, uh, the rounded uh, one, uh, the rounded head with the long neck. This one here that uh, belongs to um, uh, a type that's common in the late Neolithic Aegean, for example, the Stelia and Tarunia, and this is a torso that probably went with it. Uh, we found it separately, and not, but not too far from each other. So these two together would probably make uh, a figurine that's almost identical uh, to the one from Stelia. Um, also of interest are... Uh, uh, in some of them, we can see hands preserved and placed underneath the breasts. Um, this is the triangular torso. Um, the figurines do not seem to be um, related to any specific uh, context that we found so far. And they are found throughout the site, uh, indicating that they were not kept or curated, but used as and deposited in different areas of the settlement. And notable to say is that I, so far, all the figurines have you know, female uh, attributes. Um, to move on with the pottery, and I'm going to read this to make sure that I say everything right. Um, the pottery is generally plentiful, but very fragmentarily preserved. Uh, this is mainly due to the intense and continuous occupation of the site, at least in the part of the sentiment that has been excavated so far. Uh, cleaning activities, rebuilding, layering of surfaces, etc., seem to have taken place. And as a result, pottery has been moved a lot within the settlement. Also, the prevalence of mostly plain undecorated wares with few characteristic pieces among the material retrieved uh, make the classification and dating of the pottery assemblage a difficult task. Uh, today, we focus only on some characteristic wares uh, and shapes that help understand the phases present and the chronological span of the settlement and its occupation. The late Neolithic uh, period is attested by some characteristic painted shirts with white decoration on a dark burnished uh, background. The shirts preserve linear patterns, uh, while on sh one shirt bears evidence of white decoration on top of which red paint has been applied. This is not uncommon regarding this wear, and several other examples are known from sites such as Salagos in Antiparos Cave, Gulpinar in uh, Troad, etc. White on dark wear is characteristic to the Aegean Islands and Western Anatolia cultures, but it is also present in Evia, Eastern Attica, and other regions. Radiocarbon dates from Western Anatolia provide uh, secure dates for a horizon of dark face pottery ranging from uh, 500, 300, 5,300, excuse me, to uh, 4,300 uh, BCE. The mud painted ware, <clears throat> this guy here, uh, is represented by one bowl with carinated shoulder and fine buff slipped and burnished surface on which painted decoration is applied. Mud painted covers a variable range of fabrics and colors with a common feature that is the matte paint, as the name. The, spe the specimen preserved, preserved may be related to the late mine painted wear. This wear is characteristic of men in Greece um, and has also been reported from late Neolithic sites in the Cyclades, such as Salagos and Akrotiri, indicated the connections of the islands and the mainland. Uh, when found, it is always just a handful of shirts that are being preserved on the island sites. And from the general appearance of the shirts and the clay uh, that they were made of, it seems that they were manufactured in different regions. This is also because the proportions of pale to medium buff surface varies from site to site, 
according to the local class. In this respect, the site of Gurimadi uh, in the crossroads of the Cyclades, Attica, and area, or the rest of area, seems to act as an island site. Other characteristics of the pottery, such as horn handle uh, with a vertical perforation from a dark monochrome vessel, as well as wishbone handles or other horizontally positioned handles protruding from the vessel body, known from Ftelia, Knossos, the Balkans, and Atolia, <laughs> indicate an Aegean character uh, of the site in terms of pottery shapes and wares of this face. A variety of lugs has, and handles are also characteristic, mainly various types of horn handles. Few pattern burnished shirts, elephant lugs, plain vases with zones below rim, with incised diagonal lines, are the characteristics of the so-called Attica Kefala culture. Maybe an early part of this phase is present if we compare Gurimadi material with the finds and the absolute dating uh, coming from the Aia Triada cave also in the Caristia. Crusted ware is also present. Uh, some examples with patterns may be synchronous with the uh, They are executed on black or dark brown surfaces. It seems that crusted ware continues until the earlier parts of the early Bronze Age, as we know to be the case from sites such as a Criterion Terra or Tsepi in the Marathon. It is also present during the Attica Kefala culture. At Gurimadi, it occurs in both red and white. However, little can be said about its use due to the bad preservation. Some handles that we found may also be parts of the so-called uh, Neolithic uh, or late Neolithic scoops. Uh, many bases have traces of mud impressions, as we know uh, from the late Neolithic two sites, such as Kefala and Tarunya. The early Bronze Age one and two phases have started to be better attested during the last excavation seasons. Uh, characteristics are P3 with rope decoration, T rims, and plain pottery with horizontal or tubular lugs and handles. Some rolled rims are also present and they may belong to the both early bronze A uh, one and two uh, phases. Many cheese pot fragments belong to the early early bronze one, as we know to be the case of assemblages in sites such as the Criterion Thera, Alinea, in the Dodecanes, and many more. This particular shape has a long life and seems to appear from the later part of the late Neolithic, as we know from the sites such as Saliagos, Telia, and others. Earth finished shirts and bases of footed bowls and sauce boats are also indicative of the face. A semi coarse uh, to fine reddish orange clay may belong to this stage. We already know from the Ayat Yada cave from the same region that the fine wares coming from various Cycladic islands were present in the Caristia at least for burial use. For example, earth finished pat pattern painted wares on a light background, etc., as well as from Attica, so called the white mottled ware. Finally, many shirts bear relief and incise decoration, and they span most of the range of chronological periods present at the site. Uh, the study of pottery is ongoing, and it needs to be combined with the study of architectural and stratigraphic evidence, as well as uh, uh, absolute dating uh, techniques to help us determine the more precise uh, cultural phases, continuities, and discontinuities of the settlement history and approach with more precision aspects of production, circulation, consumption, and deposition of pottery and other artifact categories that we identified. Now, I would just like to point out the presence of these two wares uh, at the same site, because this is uh, uh, important to understand uh, where position of Saranevia is, because these are, you know, it's not about knowledge, it's more about the location because the matte painted wares are associated with central Greece, while the white and dark, so called Saligos, with Eugene. Now, of course, these are not absolute divisions, but it shows that Southern Avia uh, was at the crossroads of these two um, cultural spheres, so to speak, um, in Greece. Now, uh, our second uh, biggest product of, uh, uh, of the site of the excavation are the lithics. Our lithics are 99% obsidian. Uh, we have so far not found a single piece of obsidian that is not from uh, Milos, as far as I know. Uh, our obsidian specialist is uh, Dr. Katina Psoma, uh, working on this. Uh, the uh, interesting thing, we have many, many pieces of obsidian. We have thousands, tens of thousands, well, definitely 10,000, maybe not tens of thousands, but 10,000 and more pieces of obsidian from various different uh, production stages. So we have uh, essentially an entire chain operatoire. We have not found any unaltered pieces of obsidian, but we have primary flakes, secondary, tertiary, semi-products, uh, products of resharpening, 
porous, you name it, we got it. Uh, of course, the biggest pain to fame of Gurimadi so far is uh, the uh, large, large number of arrowheads, obsidian arrowheads. Uh, so far, we have more than 300. Uh, they, uh, there's some uh, chronological variation. We have some of those that are uh, called ovate, uh, rounded shape. They're more associated with earlier uh, phases of the Neo late Neolithic. And then some of them, they're more typical for the final Neolithic and early Bronze Age. Unfortunately, there is not much, not, not much chronological distinction between the end of the Neolithic and the early Bronze Age when it comes to lithic tools in terms of technology. So we cannot use them for precise chronological designations. Uh, however, on suggestion uh, from John Cherry, um, we are going to look for inter internal chronological variation as well to see if this uh, uh, it can tell us something about the structure of the site and its uh, chronological development. Uh, but so many arrowheads um, is almost unique uh, in this area. Uh, in all of Greece, in fact, you don't find that many arrowheads. And I think Fanis, uh, he can contribute later if uh, in the questions, has worked on a site in, in um, uh, Western Greece uh, with a Danish team, in fact, uh, that they have found also a large number of arrowheads, but a very distinct uh, uh, assemblage of animal bones that shows that they were used for hunting. Uh, we, however, have uh, all our animal bones, or most of the big majority of our animal bones are actually from domesticated animals. So why do we have so many arrowheads? Uh, we can uh, discuss later. We also found other stuff, um, just a selection of materials we have here. Uh, domestic implements such as this little ladle or spoon. We have uh, uh, polished stone tools, although not that many as we would expect from Neolithic sites and not large ones. Usually very small ones. I think the biggest one is this a big uh, that we found so far in an area that should have been wooded uh, back in prehistory. We have, from what we can see, an unaltered uh, half of a uh, spondylus shell. Uh, we have, other than the actual found the surface in the excavation layer, upper excavation layer, so early bronze, uh, we have found um, this uh, ore that's very similar actually to a final analytic one we found in the Aia Triada cave. And this season we have found this uh, piece of rock that's broken up here in the surface. So this is a perforation that we interpret at this point as an arrow shaft straightener based on similar artifacts found in North America. Um, I welcome other interpretations, of course. Uh, we believe that these, these two holes were probably made for the, the, the implement to be attached to something, maybe onto the ground so it can it will be stable and used for this purpose. And it would make sense with so many arrowheads. Now, clearly uh, this site is uh, part of a network of maritime interactions, although we didn't find uh, things that would directly point to this, uh, for example, uh, carvings of ships or boats as we do find them elsewhere in the Aegean, uh, or even boats or ships represented on the pottery or any other material. Uh, but why engage in maritime interactions is the question, and the, the usual common reply is the necessity. Uh, if the explanation goes that the communities are too small for genetic reproduction, uh, and likely presence of incest taboos that exist in many societies of this type uh, would drive people to go search for mates outside of their communities. Now, this may not necessarily be true for the Caristi as a whole, because, you know, according to some, or according to my estimates, uh, the population of the Caristia was at the very least a thousand people in any given moment, which is more than enough for uh, genetic liability. Um, Absence of raw materials and other resources, for example, metals. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. Clearly, obsidian did not come uh, from Caristos. It was imported from somewhere else. But uh, in other uh, in other ways, the Caristia or the Caristians might have been so sufficient. Uh, insufficient arable land, definitely not the case with the Caristia because unlike the other Cycladic islands, and I'm, I am, uh, you heard me right, counting the Caristia Sarnevia as part of the Cycladis in prehistory, uh, we have a lot of arable land. And proximity to other islands, which is true, because uh, Southern Avia is about 12 uh, kilometers away as the crow flies from Andros, 40 kilometers uh, from Kea, 20 kilometers from uh, Eastern Attica. Uh, and from uh, the site itself, you can see all the Cycladic islands almost to Syros on a good day. Uh, so definitely visually, phenomenologically, if you want to say, uh, they were part of 
the world to the south rather than the mainland world to the north. Now, to go back to uh, uh, to uh, Obsidian, and none of these are from uh, Gurimadi, by the way. These are from the surveys we did in uh, in the area. Uh, Gurimadi is not unique in terms of the preponderance of the Obsidian material. We found so much material Obsidian in uh, in the Caristia uh, on sites, individual pieces all over the landscape. Uh, we had one site that has 8,000 pieces that we collected from the surface. Uh, I think maybe the, the largest subsidian scattered so far in Greece that I'm aware of. I'm not kept up with the literature lately, so please forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, so clearly, this was the main raw material for the production of lithic tools. Uh, there isn't any, although there's some evidence for local uh, shirts. They're not of the very good quality. However, better quality shirts exist elsewhere, not or can be easily obtained uh, from locations that are closer to the carousels. However, uh, most of the material is still obsidian. So this was a cultural decision to use obsidian over other uh, raw materials. And obsidian, forgive me for this, <laughs> uh, could only have been gotten uh, obtained uh, by the sea route. So using a boat or a ship to travel there. The current explanation goes that likely uh, Obsidian procurement was done individually by individual communities who use it rather than people from uh, Milos trading it. This can change uh, with the advent of new evidence, of course. Also, metals. Now, uh, these, the the drawn ones, are actually from the Ayatriada cave. Uh, this is from about the same period as the thickest layer of, uh, of uh, chronologically speaking, uh, from Gurimadi. These are from the early Bronze Age burials from Ayetiada cave. And of course, these are uh, our uh, objects from Gurimadi. Uh, the analysis we've done so far show that everything uh, from uh, these earlier phases of the Bronze Age and Lake Neolithic are actually almost pure copper. So that shows a very early metallurgy, metallurgy before uh, the appearance of true bronzes uh, at the end of the early Bronze Age too, with the technology coming from Anatolia. Now. We did not test uh, our finds for uh, provenance of the raw material. So uh, we cannot say for sure where they come from, but the usual uh, sources are uh, Kithnos and and uh, Lavrio. Yes. Uh, however, there is a non-copper source, as you know, Stephanie, uh, in uh, in uh, northern part of Southern Navia. that was exploited in historical times. Uh, we do not know if it was also used in prehistoric times. So it would be good to see uh, whether we have some local uh, sourcing of the material. And, but as I said, uh, there's no indication that Gurimadi had an on-site uh, metal production. Um, I worked on metallurgical sites in Serbia. Usually when you have metallurgy in this early period, you find uh, flecks of ore all over the site, small green uh, flecks of malachite. And we found nothing of that. So our current explanation is that there was no production, there were uses, but whether the material comes uh, uh, for the production, raw material come, for the production comes locally or not, it remains to be seen. Also, we don't know much about the Gurimadians, mm -hmm. um, uh, as it were, because we have only found this so far. Uh, a very, very fragile uh, uh, piece of a skull of a uh, teenage girl, most likely. Uh, based on the preliminary results, the sky remains to be uh, excavated, micro-excavated in the lab. And probably a piece of femur that came out from a profile that belongs to an individual of the same age, if not the same individual. So we can't tell much about the actual population so far. We have not found the cemetery. Cemeteries, actually, prehistoric cemeteries in this part of the Caristia are unknown. The only place we found dead people is in uh, the Ayatriada cave. But this is a special case because uh, we have found the remains of nine individuals in the, yet the other cave um, from a period that would have produced a lot of dead bodies, to put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. uh, so the cemeteries exist somewhere, unless they're using some completely unknown uh, mode of burial that would not leave any traces. We just haven't found them yet. We have some indications where they might be around Gurimadi. We are leaving that for another time. Don't, don't tell me. <laughs> I'm not telling anybody. Um, so uh, uh, what is Gurimadi? Uh, what we know so far about Gurimadi, it should have uh, said better. 
so what this is one of the few well stratified sites that bridges this Neolithic early Bronze Age transition, and that's very important as most of the people here that work on this type of broad pottery. Early Bronze Age is not well-defined period. Uh, the transition is not well known. Most of the sites we deal with from this fun Neolithic Early Bronze Age period are usually, you know, uh, single phase and difficult to ascertain what is uh, fun Neolithic, what is Early Bronze one, because the transition was a gradual instead of a abrupt. Um, so far, this is the earliest, uh, absolutely the earliest Early Bronze Age find, uh, or rather, sorry, uh, prehistoric open air sites in Southern Avia found thus far. And to be perfectly honest, uh, full disclosure, we actually did not find any late Neolithic on the surface of the site when we surveyed the site. So our goal was to look for FN EB1 transition, but then earlier stuff started appearing. So also uh, I mentioned this so you understand that not always it's easy to see what's under the ground based on the surface material. So we might actually have other sites that we cannot recognize just based on the surveys that contain this later period until this time. And the only uh, site in the area was uh, with uh, this late Neolithic uh, white and dark pottery was the Yetriada cave, which is a special site and not suitable for habitation. Uh, so, so far, this is the only open air site uh, with this early material in the entire Southern area, which is unusual and goes more with the Cyclades than with the rest of man uh, area or mainland Greece, where you have sites from middle uh, Neolithic or early Neolithic, even predating Neolithic, as we've seen lately. Um, one of the largest uh, concentrations of obsidian arrowheads in the Aegean, we find them still quite a lot. According to our lithic specialist, this was a very important site for uh, obsidian exchange in uh, prehistory. Um, we have massive architectural remains, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> uh, uh, very unusual, or well, unusually well preserved uh, for this period. Since we have this earlier phase now in the late Neolithic, it, uh, the Christie becomes another, uh, once again, an important pot potential player in the movement of the population of the late Neolithic into the Cycladic Islands. And as I said, we found so many arrowheads, obsidian or not arrowheads, on a site with very defensive position. And all the animals that we found, the remains, and they're not well preserved, they have to be completely honest. I mean, the, the soil does not, um, or the subsequent, subsequent habitation does not uh, support uh, good preservation, but those bones that we could identify um, come mostly from domesticated uh, species, mostly sheep, goat, but we have some uh, bovines and we have, uh, 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 what else do we have? We have a lot, we can, we can talk to our uh, zoo archeologist uh, next, next lecture. Um, you don't really need an arrow to kill a sheep. Uh, so in combination with the location and the material, uh, or you can, I mean, you know, <laughs> depends on your preferences. Let, let me not be exclusive. Yes, you can do it. But uh, it's possible that we're dealing here with evidence of a conflict, and uh, we don't know yet. And evidence of conflict is notoriously difficult to find and define what it is, actually. But it, there's some indication that this might have been it, whether there was conflict, whether it was the, the, the preparation for uh, conflict situation. We don't have evidence of any large destruction in uh, Gurimadi. It seemed, the site seemed to have been abandoned instead of destroyed. Um, remains to be seen. I would like this to be evidence for conflict. Uh, whether it is or not, uh, we'll see. And before I finish, I would also like to uh, say that this site also uh, is an educational project. Uh, we bring students uh, from various places, mostly Norway, US, Greece, but other countries as well. And we train them in archeological methods and techniques um, as best as we can, depending on the availability of specialists that we have and the equipment that we have. And I'm happy to say that from next year, we're going to firm, uh, be in a formal uh, field school for uh, the college year in Athens. Uh, who will send us their students. Um, it's a, uh, uh, a very rewarding activity we have in Gurimadi because it teaches uh, the students uh, transferable skills, how to excavate a site, which is similar whether you're in Norway or in Greece, and helps them get jobs afterwards, uh, well, especially in Norway and Greece uh, job market. Yeah, no uh, job. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Greek job market at this point is not uh, promising. Uh, but they will have the skills. Uh, mm -hmm. 
for whatever they need them and including also the old fashioned skills. So we do the digital recording, but we also teach them how to do stuff without digital recording because you know you cannot always rely always rely on on um, on technology uh, in every given situation. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, before I finish, I would just like to say how fortunate I am um, to have been able to work on this project and other projects in Caristos with a lot of good friends and good people from um, uh, uh, the Ministry of Culture from the Afraid, uh, from the Institute, for various different institutes, from very different, various different universities. Um, I mentioned here some of them. I apologize to those who have who have skipped. There's been a lot of people. Um, we have had amazing, um, amazing uh, collaboration with the 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 effort uh, of Antiquities of Evia, the current and previous directors. They've uh, supported us in so many ways. Uh, my work as well. Uh, I uh, cannot even thank all the members of our team, all the students that work with us very long hours on a very very demanding site uh, under the sun uh, without complaining too much. Uh, we have been accepted uh, as their own by the local community, Carisos, which I'm very happy about. And we have received the support and help from uh, Mr. Lefteria Saviolo as the mayor. We have received funding from very different sources, primarily from uh, University of Bergen through the Norwegian Institute of Athens, but also from Institute of Regime Prehistory and uh, Terna. Uh, you have a list of people, non extensive one here, that I would like to especially thank. Uh, I'm not going to go through them. You know who you are, and I'm so, so grateful for everything. Thank you so much. Thank you both for this very exciting uh, presentation of the latest finds. Let's uh, have some questions uh, before we uh, move over to the next room for a glass of wine. Questions, comments? Um, Sorry. Thank you so much and, and congratulations mm -hmm. to, to you and all your collaborators. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, it's really amazing with all these walls you have in different faces. I, I wonder if, I mean, were these buildings abandoned and then kind of filled in with leveling fills to prepare for next construction? And is that reflected in a chronological sort of um, stratigraphy, roughly speaking? Mm. Can you uh, begin to identify that? Well, it's difficult to tell. We definitely have some leveling uh, done on the site, mm. and we have some um, concentrations of rock that probably came from all the walls. Um, it's difficult, really difficult to say uh, chronologically where we stand, you know, because we have only reached the bedrock and the foundation of some of the walls uh, this season. And in the expectation of C14 dates and the micromorphology to aid us, I really would not like to extend my, uh, you know, interpretation too much. Uh, but uh, as you can see, we have multiple phases. Uh, and as Pasali said, multiple phases within a chronological phase as well, multiple building phases. Uh, we have what we thought were uh, recent retaining walls are actually prehistoric retaining walls um, that prehistoric walls kind of abut or lie on top of. So it's difficult to say. There was definitely some destruction and some reconstruction and reuse of material and reuse of older uh, walls from older phases as foundation of modern walls. Mm -hmm. We have some walls, for example, well, maybe I should go to the walls. You know. <laughs> Once again, yes. Yes, yes. And, and you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> I'm just going to get this big picture of all the walls that we can see here. So just to look at this little area. So we, there's a wall here. There's a wall that stands on top of it. There is another wall here that abuts this wall. So probably a construction that was designed to support this wall mm -hmm. originally. We have uh, what we call the Luludi uh, here, <laughs> uh, a later period because we found the foundation of it. So it was added mm -hmm. at some later uh, phase, probably as a, a foundation for a uh, or support for a big post. Uh, we have this wall that kind of gets about uh, this wall, we have this bench here, maybe even a wall uh, that 
uh, connects to this one, we can't tell because we cannot destroy the walls. There's a wall here. There's a wall here. There's a wall here. There's a wall here. And a wall here. So it's difficult <laughs> to figure out what is what, to be honest. And, you know, we so far uh, go by a common sense approach that uh, things that find themselves within a circle are not going to be outside. I mean, I've not heard of anybody building walls that curve towards the inside. But other than that, we still need to connect some walls into architectural holes, uh, architectural units. Uh, and also the curved walls, I mean, they're not unknown uh, or unheard of from this period, but they are not as extensive because we don't have a straight wall here almost at all. So I don't know if this answers your questions. I mean, you know, the same, yeah. I should have just said, I don't know. <laughs> from the very beginning. Would have been much easier. Yes. <laughs> Very quickly, uh, is the fact that they are not straight could that have something to do uh, with um, the ground itself? Good question. Um, I don't think so, no. uh, because I mean the area here that you see is fairly flat. You know, there's some you know there's some indication that they fall. There's a mild slope going this way, so this east, east to west. Uh, but again, nothing uncommon for rectilinear walls we find everywhere else. So I, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. I just had like one question on the wall and mm -hmm. then a few questions from what is in physics. Mm -hmm. So one question, what is an Adobe structure Adobe? Adobe is, uh, uh, it's a clay structure, essentially. It's a clay, uh, often it can be, or doesn't have to be burnt. There are three different ways that uh, Neolithic people built walls that I'm aware of. Uh, most of them we don't find in this part of, of Greece. Uh, using Adobe uh, architecture, one is uh, building a uh, stone uh, foundation and then putting uh, uh, posts with twigs in between and then putting clay on both sides. That's Watland Dope. There's PCA technique, which is you build essentially walls made of uh, uh, planks and then you pack uh dirt or clay usually mixed with straw uh pieces of pottery what have you inside and then there are the mud bricks usually uh unbaked uh that we find in on some sites uh we have none of that here uh, and usually when uh, walls are destroyed they appear as dope as uh, burnt reddish clay we have pieces of that but not enough to say that they were walls uh on top of the foundation so our working hypothesis is that these were structures, as Basali said, mostly made of stone. And um, we have no bricks for sure. And when there is a big superstructure made of this adobe of clay that was not destroyed by fire and it just melted away, usually you can see it stratigraphically uh, as more or less sterile layers on the site. We don't have this. And uh, one more on the pottery. Mm -hmm. oh. So were the pot like from inside these like Walls are close to the walls, or it's going outside the wall. Because I have gone to the university to be the uh, week ago, mm -hmm. and the my new book says that there are some parts like outside the walls, like ancestor kind of. Is there, there something similar in the religious context or in cultic context? Yeah, they're from all over. I mean, there's no okay. yeah uh, everywhere. Uh, like they come literally from everywhere in large quantities. We have no we okay, we have some concentrations, of course. Uh, mm. This area here and this area here produced a lot of pottery, you know, a big pile of pottery, including bird soil. You know, we don't know what to make of it yet. Could have been an event uh, of some kind, feasting event, maybe the uh, destruction of this room. We don't know, but we find pottery everywhere and there's no specific concentration that we could say, you know, this pottery comes from here, this type comes from there. And here, uh, this area has produced a lot of pottery uh, from the beginning to the end. It's kind of mixed with building material, and other what have you. And with obsidian, yes, uh, because you said there's this years of production, like from the from, like, from the mm -hmm. thing itself to finish. Mm -hmm. Can it be said that there was like like they had like a stockpile of a warehouse or like I can just pick something up and I'm gonna just need mm -hmm. because also um, that there was no. It's not like hunting thing. It's like good question um i am not sure that we can answer that at the moment we don't have a pile we have found some concentrations like two or three uh cores in some areas here i think you know along this wall um 
that could have been interpreted as you know somebody was intensively working on the lithics. But we have found no stockpile. Um, clearly, they had to stockpile something somewhere because you know getting to uh, Milos uh, probably took a week of journey, hopping from one island to the to another. So probably not uh, something that you would do every day. Uh, so a certain piles or amounts had to be transported and kept and used locally, but um, no stockpiles, no. And uh, again, with Milos, because you said that it looks literally facing towards the island and mm -hmm. not like towards the mountain mm -hmm. or towards Athens or like region. Uh, can you picture that this the fit intrinsically had like a connection towards uh, the cyclades or like the region? Like the people were similar and like my family from there, I'm just going to mm -hmm. get my stuff there. I need to make a big connection, but. We can tell. We can tell. Uh, that's actually a very good question, and we can tell because, uh, for example, the only uh, you you can tell that by where people grew up, and you look uh, where people grew up or where they came from by uh, analyzing uh, stable isotopes like oxygen, strontium, stuff like that, and um, you can do this. We did it in the Aia Triada, for example, the only burials that we have uh, in uh, this part of San Nevi of Oravia or. The Christia, and they were all local and also did not eat much fish. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, we can't tell. I mean, there was definitely communication with the Cyclades. Now, the extent of communication, how involved they were in personal terms, is a matter of speculation at this point. Mm -hmm. If I may, I have another question. Uh, <laughs> what I Maybe a thought more than a question, but just um, I'm wondering and interested in hearing if you have similar considerations, but whether this was not an all year habitation site, but some kind of special, let's call it special purpose site mm -hmm. with a kind of social cultural memory site, also given the geographical location where people came on and off mm -hmm. is there how yeah how do you actually how do you actually look for that yeah, yes. okay. <laughs> uh, exactly how to look for that i mean yes we have definitely discussed it uh, uh, sorry, yes. domesticated animal bones which is how you yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. which period they were slaughtered what age yes <laughs> But also, uh, we don't have this information at the no, moment no. because we don't have that many animal bones. Uh, we have found no hiatus in the occupation, but hiatus in the occupation that seasonal would not appear. Mm. I mean, you have to be hiatus over a couple of centuries to uh, appear. Also, we have domestic uh, use, but again, domestic use doesn't have to be year round. I mean, you can come there, use the site, go somewhere else. Mm. I don't know. Again, stop asking me these questions. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Should we continue the discussion or is it any other, any other question? Or... Comments, suggestions, critique? Mm -hmm. um, All questions from people online. Oh, yeah. It's a, has anybody? No. Uh, but can you say it? Because I don't know if you, you can make it here. But uh, can make... If there are any questions from people online, <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> you can uh, text them, right? Uh, on Zoom. Yeah, you can text them on Zoom and Pasalis is going to. Oh, yeah. I can ask a general question. Yes. What will happen next year then? Right. Uh, okay. What will happen next year? <laughs> more of this. <laughs> more, more walls. Yes, more, more walls. walls. So our goal now is to expand the excavation as much as possible to uncover as much of architecture as possible to be able to make better connections. So for this purpose, we're going to open one large trench uh, on the west. Right. We have the slide next week. Ah, yes, actually. Yeah. You're right. And there it is. Uh, so this is going to be trench 10 uh, on the west of the currently excavated area, which is this here. Um, we're going to continue uh, digging in trench one because we have some areas that we still need to reach the bedrock in. And this is, again, vertical stratigraphy that we're following here. Uh, trench four is promising. We have found another uh, domed oven there. We're going to continue there. Um, trenches uh, T uh, six, five, and eight, uh, and mostly three are usually undiggable anymore. And seven because they're full of walls. Uh, trench nine, we opened last year. We're going to continue there. Also, promising trench. I have a feeling we're not going to be able to go very deep based on what we've seen so far because there's walls. Uh, we are opening another trench uh, 
uh, further to the south to actually see how the settlement extends in the area where we found the most material on the surface because we didn't have a chance uh, to do this thus far. We were focusing on the walls. <laughs> But we also uh, plan to reopen Trench 2 because it provides an important connection. Um, this is actually the, the, the northernmost uh, boundary. Uh, boundary of Trench 2. So we discovered this wall. We thought it was a retaining wall that we could see. Uh, there was a modern, or modern being in the last couple of hundred years, a retaining wall. But actually, when we excavated, we found that this wall actually is connected to the retaining wall. And this guy here as well. So prehistoric retaining wall. So, we are trying to expand horizontally to uncover as much of architecture as possible to be able to make more uh, secure connections and go deeper into uh, the vertical stratigraphy to get as much information on the stratigraphy, stratigraphy as possible. Any questions online? No. Okay. okay, then before we uh, move on, uh, I would like to say that uh... Anybody who wants to leave his email, her email, uh, we have a um, visitor book, so we can include you in our mailing list. Um, we also have a new newsletter from uh, 2023. Then uh, we can uh, send it to you, and so you know. And our next lecture is planned for January 16. Uh, it explores whiteness in a very um, context uh, from the... Uh, late classical times so um we are hoping to see more of you next time thank you so much for coming and have a good christmas and a new year thank you thank, thank you, you very much, much.